So I, I can't help but smile as we're going through these, uh, these videos, all the stuff in the news that reinforces what was said in these videos starting from eight years ago that he made these, this video, how much in the news reinforces. Um, for example, what's going on in Hong Kong right now? Huh? What, what's going on in, in, in Hong Kong? It's protests. Huh? Protests at the airport? There's protests. There's in Hong Kong? They, they did what? Waving the American flag. There's a protest involving millions of people. Why? Because they have been under freedom for so long, and now they're at direct risk of losing their freedom. They realize what's at stake. Uh, and is it at stake? Absolutely. Why, what's going on? Mainland China wants to do what? They want to put them under, back under communism. And the people who've lived under freedom want nothing to do with it. I just hope and pray that America wakes up. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate about Trevor Loudon, and I'm not sure when in the video he talks about this. Rusty, you, you have the video. Is it still queued up at the same point? It's not? Okay, you're going to want to be at 21 minutes and 56 seconds into the video. So tr one of the things I like about Trevor Loudon, he's from New Zealand, and he makes the point very clearly, as America goes, so goes the world. If, if we lose freedom in America, we've lost freedom for the world for a very long time, like hundreds of years. I mean, we, we're all assuming the Lord's coming, right? So we don't have to worry about it. But uh, in all fairness, this is a, an extremely important uh, battle. Let's just begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to consider these truths. We pray that you would guide our thoughts today in our Savior's precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, Rusty, how are we doing? You got her keyed, queued up there? All right. I think we're, we're good to go. Make sure, you ha make sure you have a copy of the deal you can fill in. And if we run out of one, we'll start another, give you another one. There you go. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> 21 minutes and 20th century seconds. was. See, that what tried to convince the world. They call it uh, socialism. There's a lot. Karl Marx, the father of modern day communism, there died. The assumption that communism would die with him was a logical one, since only nine people attended his funeral. Is it loud enough? In October of that same year in London, a England, a group was forming called the Fabian Socialist Society. The Fabian Socialists decided that they were going to socialize the world uh, incrementally. They called it uh, socialism by evolution instead of Marxist socialism by revolution. It always worked in tandem with the communists. Some Fabians were also communists. There was a bit of interchange of membership. And the Fabian Socialists are slowly but surely bringing about uh, the socialization of the world. Uh, Europe is uh, pretty well done. They are not working in Latin America. Latin America is not just socialistic in many countries. They're all already Marxist. You have uh, hardcore Marxists in Venezuela, in uh, Nicaragua. El Salvador just won communistic, and of course Fidel is sitting right there laughing at this whole thing. And we haven't even figured this thing out yet. We don't even know there's a, a, a red plague coming, coming up to meet us. We think that we're just going to watch the cartoons on Saturday morning and everything will be fine. They had a, uh, a lot to do with bad stuff happening. There are two things I found that gave me a good idea where the Fabians were really coming from. First of all, their symbol was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And secondly, George Bernard Shaw, who was a leader in the Fabians for almost 50 years said, quote, I am a communist, but not a member of the Communist Party. Stalin is a first-rate Fabian. I am one of the founders of Fabianism and as such, very friendly to Russia, unquote. Fabians eventually beget the Students for Democratic Society, which beget the Weather Underground, which beget the 
basically the social changes that have happened in America in the last 40 years. Many of the SDS members from the 1960s still have an incredible influence on the direction our country is heading. One is the Reverend Jim Wallace, who was president of SDS when he was a student at Michigan State University. And yet today, he is the spiritual advisor to the President of the United States. They've been friends for many years. They go back to Chicago and the Chicago politics crowd. And during the Vietnam War, he was rooting for the Viet Cong to beat the United States Army. And when they did, he, couldn't, he just couldn't believe it. He said it was one of the happiest days in his life. And another leader in the Students for a Democratic Society and founder of the Weather Underground is William Ayers who has been a longtime friend and neighbor of President Obama. It came out in 2009 that Obama's book, Dreams from My Father, was even written by Ayers. So the influence from the Fabian Socialist Society goes right into the White House. The next group I found that has seriously impacted America's culture is the Frankfurt School. The Frankfurt School was a sort of a, an outpost in America of European socialism. Willie Munzenberg, with, with a few other uh, Bolsheviks, founded the Frankfurt School. The two leading members are Herbert Marcuse and Franz Neumann. Franz Neumann was, in fact, a Soviet agent. Their entire purpose was to uh, stand the entire educational system of the West, and the United States in particular, on its head. Bertrand Russell, who worked with the Frankfurt School, said, by using psychological techniques to teach the children, we will be able to produce, quote, an unshakable conviction that snow is black, unquote. They established a school here. With the help of John Dewey, he helps bring these German intellectuals to America in 1933, drop them down at Princeton, Berkeley, Brandeis, to go after education and media. Included in those goals were the teaching of homosexuality and sexuality to children, the promotion of excessive drinking, and destruction of religion in the United States. That was a big one. And they basically started the social rot. Willie Munzberg said, we are gonna make the West so corrupt it stinks. I love spending time with my family, July 4th, baseball and apple pie, in my mind can't even comprehend that there were groups of intellectuals back in the 1930s plotting and planning how they could make America so corrupt it stinks. There are certain lines and certain limits and the left has always pushed it as hard as they can, as far as they can, and will protect any pornographer, any deviant, any Cult, any negative cultural form they can find, basically to degrade the culture. And that goes right along with the feminism of today, which was part of the Frankfurt School's desire to destroy a patriarchal society for a matriarchal society. In other words, remove the father as the loving provider, discipliner, uh, discipler, uh, leader of his home, where you instill virtues and integrity and modesty. That's been broken down on purpose, because they knew if they could destroy the family, they could destroy a nation. And instead of having a father who leads and disciples and protects the home, and provides for the family, the government steps in as a nanny state. The Frankfurt School developed the concept of cultural Marxism. Penetrate the culture, take it over, and then everything else will follow. And of course they did that, and today we've had a complete cultural revolution. As many people in America are familiar with the phrase, make love, not war, that actually came from Herbert Mucuza, who was with the Frankfurt School. So these guys went after education, they went for media, and they've been very successful in changing the entire worldview of Americans through what they call political correctness, but it's really cultural Marxism with the goal being to destroy Christianity, then create chaos, and then move to their ultimate goal, which is from cultural Marxism to traditional Marxism, which is socialism. Most of the strategy to remake America from within started with Antonio Gramsci, who wrote over 2,000 pages back in the 1930s outlining how to take a Judeo-Christian culture down from the inside. The plan he suggested has been the main focus of the left ever since. 
Antonio Gramsci was a, a neo-Marxist uh, philosopher. Antonio Gramsci was an Italian communist. Antonio Gramsci is probably the, the biggest troublemaker in the world. He's probably got more, more responsibility for our social ills than anybody else on the planet. He knew of the importance of undermining the morals and the character of, of this country. Because America had a strong Christian heritage, you had to uh, attack the culture. You had to change the culture. It's even to pornography and to areas that uh, most people normally wouldn't accept. He said that we're going to destroy the West by destroying its culture. We're going to infiltrate and we're going to turn their music, their art, and their literature against them. That means that you penetrate the universities, uh, you write the books, the novels, the poetry, the music, the book reviews. And once you control the culture, then you can sort of shape the thought of rising generations. He differed with Marx instead of, for example, uh, destroying the church and the other basic institutions. He said infiltrate them and use them to change the culture. What uh, Gramsci had to say was that this is the way that government is perpetuated and society is perpetuated is through these churches because they set the standards, they set the framework of the way people lived, of rules, how families should be structured. He didn't want a, a revolution on the streets that would be overturned by the police the next day. He wanted to change society over the long term so that we would have a revolution without us even realising it, basically. And the communists have been very effective in promoting their ideology in Hollywood, in the mass media. And I think he was quite right. I think that's exactly what has happened. I think that's what's worked. I think it's working that way now. And that's where a lot of these people come from. And that's been the big success story of communism in the last 50 years. It's the professors, it's the educationalists, it's the journalists. They are the shock troops, the Gramscian shock troops of the future. And one of Gramsci's all-star disciples, Saul Alinsky, became one of the most influential radicals of the 1960s. Well, Saul Alinsky was a, he was a prominent radical in, in 1930s Chicago. He worked closely with the Communist Party. He used to go down um, and train at the rifle range with Leon Dupre, who was uh, later a mentor of Barack Obama. And they used to train to shoot because they knew the revolution was just around the corner. But that didn't come, so they, he, he got a bit more subtle. Well, Saul Alinsky called for a um, uh, community organizer to stir things up, to create uh, agitation. In fact, he said you'll be accused of being an agitator, and that's exactly what you are. He wanted the haves and have-nots fighting with each other. It wasn't until Rusty I was watching an old film. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about so far what we have here a little bit. So, uh, first of all, uh, what struck you? What jumped off the page? for you as we were looking at this. Yes, Helen? It's been going on a long time. Okay. Right. By the way, if you want a complete transcript of this whole thing, because I know it's not always easy to hear. Sometimes they're talking fast, and Trevor Loudon with his accent, I know it's a little hard to understand all of it. If you want a complete transcript, because I've taken the time to listen to the whole thing over and over and over and transcript it all, send me an email and say, please send me a transcript and I will send it to you, okay? Um, <clears throat> I didn't really ask them for permission to do that, but, but I just think it's really helpful. It helps me to be able to look at what's, what's here. Okay, what else strikes you? Who started all this is where, where he begins this section. Who started all this? He goes back to Karl Marx. How many people were present at his funeral? Pretty weird, isn't it? To think that a guy who had nine people, only nine people show up at his funeral, and yet it's a movement that's basically taking over the world right now uh, because of his ideology. And so we know that, um, as it says here, in October of that same year in London, England, a group was forming called the what social society? Fabian. Fabian Socialist Society. Now, I think it's important, and that's the reason I gave to you 
the part that you can fill in to follow and to have these names down because th- this is not just um, make-believe. These are actual names and specific things that if you have doubts, you can go and research it online and find out the truthfulness of everything that's here. All right, Fabian Socialist Society saw, saw, thought they were going to socialize the world how? How are they going to socialize the world? Incrementally, yeah, from within, but incrementally, a little, a little bit at a time, okay? Huh? Oh, yeah, incrementally. Well, they're getting to the point now they don't even have to do it incrementally anymore. They're pa- almost past that phase. But, but that's what they've been doing for a lot of years. They call it socialism by evolution instead of Marxist socialism by revolution. Okay? George Bernard Shaw. Well, we've heard that name before, haven't we? He was a leader in the Fabians for almost 50 years. He said, I am a communist, but not a member of the Communist Party. How convenient. So they're playing a, a, a shell game so that you don't really know what's going on. And then he said, Stalin is a first-rate Fabian. I'm one of the founders of Fabianism, and as such, very friendly to Russia. All right? Fabians eventually begat Students for a Democratic Society. Are you kidding me? Students for a Democratic Society? Students for a Socialist Society. Once again, they lie. They, they're, 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 they're deceitful about what they really stand for. And the weather underground came out of that. And... So the socialist changes that we see taking place over the last 40 years. And then this Reverend Jim Wallace. How many of you have had heard of J- Reverend Jim Wallace before this? Okay, just a few. Michigan State University. Why is he a reverend at all? Uh, president of Students for Democratic Society when he was at Michigan State. And under President Obama, he became the spiritual advisor to the President of the United States. How do you have a spiritual advisor that's an atheist? Isn't that interesting? All right, another leader... In the Students for Democratic Society, the founder of the Weather Underground's William Ayers. Oh, we've heard that name. Wasn't he arrested at one time? Didn't he go to prison at one time? And yet, here he is powerfully influencing the course of American politics in our day. Uh, longtime friend and neighbor of President Obama came out in 2009 that the book, Obama's book, Dreams from My Father, was actually written by William Ayers. Figure that one out. Hmm. Interesting. All right, so then he talks about the Frankfurt School, um, an outpost of American European socialism, and Willie Munzenberg, founder of the, Frank, founder of the, uh, the Frankfurt School. Okay, Herbert Marcuse and Frank, Franz Norman. Uh, Franz Norman, turns out, was actually a Soviet agent. So here are these people in influential places in American uh, education and politics and media, and they're, they're, they're communists, really communists at heart. Okay, so Bertrand Russell says, by using psychological techniques to teach the children, we will be able to produce an unshakable conviction that snow is black. And when you think about what's happened in the public school system, and we're going to see more about that and, uh, further on, that's basically what they're doing, is they're just brainwashing uh, children. Okay? Then there's the name John Dewey. Boy, we all know about... What's the Dewey Decimal System? Our books are categorized in the, you know, this guy had a fundamental influence on American education. And he brought these principles to America in 1933, dropped them down in Princeton, Berkeley, and Brandeis to go after education and media. So the goals were to teach what? Homosexuality? Sexuality to children? The promotion of excessive drinking? and the destruction of religion in the United States. Well, those are really high and noble goals for an educator. And yet, that's exactly what's happened. I, I, you know, just in recent years, I've heard several times about Oregon, Uni- University of Oregon and Eugene, that um, I've seen newspaper articles, not just recently, but in the last couple of years, that the professors are having a hard time getting students to come to class sober. That they're, they're, they're so intoxicated, the students, they're just one big beer party, that, that most of the time he, the professors are up there cl- teaching a class full of students that are either asleep or not there because of the alcoholism. And so you look at, if that was his goal back in the 1930s, how has he done in, in achieving that goal? It's like 100% success. And that's exactly where we're at 
in, in the day in which we live. So we're seeing the, the, the consequences of cultural Marxism. So that's what they called it. Frankfurt School developed the concept of cultural Marxism. So instead of, instead of coming in with an army to invade and win, instead they've, they've worked to corrupt and change our whole culture, and they've succeeded. And so they want to teach homosexuality, sexuality, and destroy religious thinking, all right? So then we see this Antonio Gramsci, wrote over 2,000 pages in, back in the 30s, outlining how to take a Judeo-Christian culture down from the inside. And what he, just, what he laid out has been exactly what's happened in America ever since. He was a neo-Marxist philosopher, Italian communist. Okay, and because America had a strong, what kind of heritage? Christian heritage. You had to attack the culture. You had to change the culture. So he differed from Marx in that he said, don't tear down the churches, but infiltrate them. Now let's think about that for a moment. In what way can we see the, the results of that philosophy in churches today? Do we see it? So how? How, how have they done this? How have they managed to infiltrate churches? Political correctness? Jim? Dest destroy the Bible is, is certainly right there at the top of the list, isn't it? All right? Huh? Music. How, how does music, how can that be used to, to infiltrate our churches? Or how does, that, what, how does that affect? Okay, becomes entertainment. How, how many heard of uh, what happened this week, this past week, of another uh, pop figure in, in, in big churches uh, says, I'm no longer a Christian? One of, the, one of the guys from Hillsong. Okay? And... So you're looking at this, and you're starting to see these figures that young people have been looking up to for years. And this guy was Marty, what's his name? I don't remember his name. Anyway, he's, young people have been looking up to some of these guys, music professionals at big churches like Hillsong for years, decades, and all of a sudden they come out and say, oh, I'm not a Christian. Well, what does that do to the young? I mean, he's written songs that, that young people sing. I, I had to look through the names of the songs real quick to say, oh, are we doing any of those songs? Thankfully, we're not. But it's like, what on earth is going on? So we find that the very principles that, that these guys use to try and cult, to use cult, develop cultural Marxism in America are working to this very day. Okay, So they didn't want a revolution on the streets. And it's been the, it's been the big success for, story of communism for the last 50 years. It's the professors, the educationalists, the journalists, and the pastors. He didn't say that, but he should have. Yeah, it's the pastors. How is this possible that are actually being used by the communists to transform American culture? All right? So then he goes on to Saul Alinsky, which was one of Gramsci's all-star disciples. And one of the most influential radicals of the 60s, Saul Alinsky, right? Saul Alinsky was a prominent radical in 1930 Chicago, worked with the Communist Party. This is interesting. Saul Alinsky would go down and train at the rifle range with Leon Dupre, who was a later a member of, uh, who was later a mentor of Barack Obama. They were training at the rifle range because they still were planning on doing a, 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 a violent takeover when they finally became persuaded that's not the right way to do it. We need to do a, a, a calm and, and peaceful takeover, a little at a time. All right? Let's see here. I'm trying to stay on, figure out what I'm doing here. Six, seven. Oh, yeah. So, is that where we stopped? Okay. All right. So, any other, any other thoughts that just strike you at this point from... Uh, Cultural Marxism, penetrate the culture. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, I, I, yes, go ahead, Nancy. Hi. Yes. Barack Obama went to high school in Hawaii. Yes. And his, his two friends, they were a trio, not a musical trio, but uh, <laughs> they um, were dousing themselves in all of this stuff. Yes. During high school, and I have... A friend's picture, it was her uh, brother, I think, that 
knew about this, and she was telling me all about it a few years ago about him. Okay, right. So it, he was into it. So, so um, one of the things that they really promoted was the use of pornography. And he said, we're going to destroy the West by destroying its culture, and we're going to infiltrate their music and art and literature and so forth. And, um, but here's what's interesting. This, this little, there's so many fingers in this whole mess, but this, this issue of pornography. Um, okay, when, when I was growing up, when I was in high school, we all knew about pornography because the whole uh, Playboy magazine thing had, had exploded and, and um, before what had been considered uh, was, it was actually illegal right, in America, suddenly became, well, it's protected under the First Amendment. You have a right, you know, freedom of expression and so forth. And so uh, at that time, um, if a person really wanted pornography, they could get to it. But you had to work at it a little bit. You had to go to a store and buy dirty magazines or whatever. But now we're to the point where Conservative estimates are 50% of pastors in Bible-preaching churches are using pornography on a fairly regular basis. And the number is 70% of people in the pews. And we're to the point where it isn't just men using pornography, it's women. And I'm just sitting there scratching my head saying, what has happened to the church? So we can have a a, a wonderful church, even a Bible-preaching church, that has 500 people. But if the church is compromised with it from within by the use of pornography, we've lost all spiritual power. There's no way in the world that we can have the, the Holy Spirit filling and empowering us to do His work, while on the other hand, we're walking in the flesh. And so, um, I mean, I remember when I was in high school, I had several friends, and they had their own private stash of dirty magazines. And, and uh, back then, it was sort of like that. Now, it's like you can't turn on your computer. You can't access even news and things. It's everywhere. So a person can't just be passive about defending themselves. Now they have to be active. There has to be an active resistance, an active crying out to God and saying, Lord, fill me with your spirit, because Galatians 5 says that's the only solution. And so we, we've got to get serious about realizing that just because things are still going along and, and, and it's not too bad and there's still a few churches here and there, but if we're compromised from the inside out, we're falling right into the trap that these people have laid. And, and it's not, a, I, I think that there's probably a lot of Christians who, and, and apparently even pastors who say to themselves, well, it, 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 this won't hurt anybody. It, it, this, is just a, you know, this is just something I do when I'm alone and nobody's around. And that, 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 that really won't hurt anyone. And that's a lie right from the pit of hell. And we need to recognize it and face it and deal with it. And um, we need to understand that God does not, uh, exp- does not desire for us to be defeated by pornography. There is victory in, in the Lord Jesus Christ and in walking the Spirit. Now, I'm going to tell you it's not easy because we live in a day where it's everywhere. But it is possible to have victory over this sin of pornography. And if we don't, we're going to wake up one morning a communist nation. It, it, it's that serious. Okay, Rusty, I think we're ready to roll again here. From World War II that I realized what the left has been doing in America to pit the poor against the rich, blacks against whites, and the young against the old is the same tactic Hitler used to disunify Germany. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country. So they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Remember that when you hear this kind of talk. Somebody is going to get something out of it. And it isn't going to be you. Yeah. And they used the conflict as justification for more government to stop the chaos. So they create the chaos, and then they step in as a solution to the chaos. And as Francis Schaeffer said, once this chaos comes, most people will willingly give over to an authoritarianism because they don't want the chaos. His book was kind of the field manual, if you will, for these activist organizations. Which President Obama studied and taught at a workshop for four years in Chicago as a community organizer for ACORN. As I was reading through Rules for Radicals to see where he was coming from, I just happened to take a look at the dedication in the front of the book. And this is what I saw. 
quote, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer, unquote. Saul Alinsky from Antonio Gramsci has had an incredible amount of influence on our president and on our society, and he dedicates his book openly to Lucifer, Satan? I think that says more about where their ideas and plans are based than anything else. You asked what Saul Alinsky's impact is on the leftist movement today, and it basically defines it. It defines it. Saul Alinsky took the best of Gramsci and the best of the Fabian Socialist ideas, combined, repackaged, and sold them to the 60s radicals. After studying Alinsky, Richard Cloward and his wife, Frances Fox Piven, came up with what is today known as the Cloward-Piven strategy. Now their idea was basically that to destroy society or destroy capitalism per se, they needed to overload the system. It was, the idea was to get everybody you possibly could on welfare, to get everybody you possibly could basically milking the system in some way or another. It was called the crisis strategy, and it became very well known by activists and radicals in the 60s. They published an article in the May 1966 issue of Nation magazine called The Weight of the Poor in which they outlined their strategy. Rathke read that article and Rathke ended up starting what we now know today as ACORN. And of course, Cloward and Piven had been studying Saul Alinsky. So Antonio Gramsci gives us Saul Alinsky. Saul Alinsky gives us the Cloward and Piven strategy, this husband and wife that said, hey, let's collapse the American economy by implementing so many entitlements, so much of a welfare state it collapsed. He, Rathke, studied the Cloward and Piven strategy. He starts ACORN. And of course, ACORN gave us Obama. And to show what a small world it is, Wade Rathke, who started ACORN, was the draft resistance organizer for SDS, the group the Fabian started. They've used that strategy ever since to expand voting roles, to expand um, welfare roles wherever they can, basically just to overload the system, to increase the tax burden on the middle class, and basically bring capitalism one step closer to destruction. I guess we shouldn't be surprised that we still have open borders, that so many people are dependent on the government, and that the left keeps pushing these programs when all they've done is tear apart the black families in America and create generational cycles of poverty. The last group that has worked alongside the Fabians and the Frankfurt School using Gramsci's approach is the Communist Party USA. Probably the most important book on this subject is called Towards Soviet America by William Z. Foster. William Z. Foster was the head of the Communist Party himself. Uh, he ran for the president of the United States in 1932, but in the book Towards Soviet America, he literally lays out chapter by chapter by chapter what is entailed to bring about a USSA, not just a USSR. Two of the movements they started in America have played a significant role in tearing apart our families, in breaking down our morality. Uh, Betty Friedan is credited with really starting the feminist movement in this country. The purpose really was to attack full-time homemakers, to get them out of the home, to make them think they live dreary lives, to make women feel they are victims. It's the science of victimology. And um, that is so unfortunate because the American woman is the most fortunate class of people who ever lived on the face of the earth. And to try to tell them that they, they are victims of an oppressive, unjust uh, uh, patriarchy is, is just a, a grievous lie. But unfortunately, they are teaching young women that and have been doing it for many years. 
While Betty Friedan was pushing her book, Feminine Mystique, she implied that she was coming from the point of being a frustrated housewife herself and just wanted to be a help to other women. But later in the 1990s, it came out, she was in fact a radical propagandist for the Communist Party and a staunch supporter of Stalin. So when she had described the American family as, quote, a comfortable concentration camp, unquote, it wasn't because of her experience at home. It was because she was just doing her part to dismantle our families. I'm a student of communism, and the communists set up gr uh, various groups and various societies. Their society that they set up to promote homosexuality in this country was called the Mattachine Society. And it was founded by Henry Hay, a leading member of the Communist Party. So since I was studying communism and teaching on the, on, on the issue of communism, you just follow leads, and all of a sudden you realize, what is this Mattachine? I've never heard of this Mattachine Society. Well, it was Henry Hayes' organization set up to infiltrate the culture of the United States to make homosexuality normal. It's always been a movement dominated by the left. It's um, all these so-called isms. You will find there's a, there's a communist or a socialist behind every one of them, and you'll, 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 you'll always see their targets. It's, it's basically the traditional family unit. The war is still against the family. If you go back to the Communist Manifesto and read Karl Marx carefully, the war is against what they called the bourgeois family, which was really the biblical family, father, mother, and child. They want to plow through marriage. They want to, they want to change the very definition and meaning of marriage because their open door to engineering society in this utopian way uh, is blocked by the very values of our Christian civilization that's taught through marriage. And so the left just has got to destroy the family because if there's any one thing that will prevent the left from carrying out its agenda, it's healthy and strong nuclear families. And so from the Fabian Socialist Society to the Frankfurt School to Antonio Gramsci and the Communist Party USA, from these four, you will find connections to almost every left-leaning person and organization in America. Their influence has been incredible. It was in the 1960s, all the groups on the left seemed to realize Antonio Gramsci was right. In a Judeo-Christian society, you will never be able to persuade people to rise up in a Marxist revolution and start killing each other off. The only way to take the culture down is through penetrating the institutions of influence to change the people from within. This section started out, he was watching a, a, a World War II film. And it helped him to connect the dots. And in the World War II film, he had the older man in Germany explaining to the younger man about something. You remember what he was talking about? Huh? Same old tactic. Which, which was? Conflict. Okay. Conflict how? Okay. So Hitler realized he couldn't, he wasn't strong enough to take on Germany when they were unified. So he had to create conflict. Conflict between whom? Anybody. E economic conflict, the, the haves against the have-nots. Chaos and conflict between races. These Jews are the ones that are giving you problems. We've got to, got to get rid of the Jews, right? So he knew how to create these, take, take advantage or create conflict and then take advantage of the conflict that he'd created. And that's so, in, so important for us to see their tactics, and it hasn't changed a bit. They're doing exactly the same thing today. So he says, I love what the, guy, the old man in the movie says. You see, they knew that they were not strong enough to conquer a unified country, so they split Germany into small groups. They used prejudice as a practical weapon to cripple the nation. Remember this when you hear this kind of talk. 
Somebody is going to get something out of it, and it isn't going to be you. But what are they doing right now? They're, they're putting in the heads of, of people that don't have the, the, the brains to think it through for themselves, which sadly sometimes is all of us, that they're creating these conflicts. We have right now uh, this idea of, of uh, reparations. What is reparations all about? Pay back who? Well, you know, there were Irish Americans that were slaves too. So, so there, it, wasn't just, it wasn't just one racial group that was enslaved. Um, and, and let's face it, the Japanese during World War II who had become American citizens weren't exactly treated with a lot of class and character either, right? Uh, I know up in Salem, Oregon, as you just head just north out of Salem, there's a whole area of the most fertile ground for growing onions that was all owned by the Japanese, but during World War II, they were thrown into, into camps and it was confiscated and they never got it back. We did all kinds of things uh, to, to different racial, racial groups. So they're going to take and, and try and create chaos amongst races, and they're doing it. They're succeeding. And, and that's the sad part is, is in so many cases, we're allowing them to do so. Okay, so we see Acorn, we see um, and, and, uh, Cloward Piven. This husband-wife team, students of, oh, also, of course, Saul Linsky's dedication of his book, dedicates it to Lucifer. Boy, if that, if that doesn't cause us to, to stop and say, hey, wait a minute, that should, shouldn't it? But then the basic idea of Cloward Piven was to overload the system. How are they going to overload the system? Everybody in welfare and open borders. Get as many people coming in to vote illegally as possible. Wow. Wow, that sounds like, uh, you know, something that just, this has been in the works for uh, 60 years, that they, that's what they've been striving towards. This is why they are so filled with anger against the current president. Love him or hate him, he has set back the clock on their agenda, and they're furious, okay? There's a lot of things about DT that I'm not very happy about. Some people think he's already become a Christian because he's declared it. I personally am not persuaded. Uh, until I see some more evidence, uh, it's, it's going to be hard to persuade me. It's possible, but I, I have strong doubts. But in any case, love him or hate him, he has set back this agenda a little bit, which is why, this, is why they're so angry and why this next election is so critically important. Jim, you're going to make a comment. They get on the dole, they're supported. It's going to break the system. Completely. Exactly. Exactly. It isn't just for the vote. It's to overload the system. If, if, if you know ahead of time that a thief is coming to your house at 9 o'clock on Saturday night, and, and, and you know exactly how he's going to come, he's going to, he's going to come through the back window, what do you do? Just walk away and let him do it? That's what we're doing. That's exactly what we're doing. We're allowing the communist agenda. It's all spelled out. We can read it and see it, and we're just like, huh? May God help us to wake up while it's still possible to wake up and make a difference. All right? Um, so acorn, mm -hmm. voting rolls, okay. What else do you see here? Oh, so of course then... Uh, <clears throat> Of course, then the two movements, feminist movement and the homosexual movement, right? And um, well, I, I can't imagine that that's an issue today. How many of you know the name Candace Owens? Are you familiar with the name Candace Owens? You should write it down if you don't. Candace, C-A-N-D-A-C-E, Owens, O-W-E-N-S. And if you really want to get the story of Candace Owens, I would encourage you to go on YouTube and look up Candace Owens at Liberty University, as they had her there to speak, and she tells her story. She was a young woman uh, when she was in high school. Um, she's black. Um, her parents were marginal Christians. I think they had a broken home situation, but her grandfather really knew the Lord, and her grandfather took in her, his granddaughters and tried to get them founded in Scripture, but still she just... She wasn't all that interested. Well, at some point when I think she was still in high school, um, 
a couple boys, four boys were out on a joyride one night, and they decided to, uh, let's, let's, let's send this Candace, you know, a, a text. And, and, and so all of them conspired, and they, it was just mean, that's all it was, and racially charged. Well, she was, you know, obviously very hurt by it, and uh, the next day she was at school, and, and it was being discussed in school, something about racism and so forth, and so she just showed her professor after school this, these texts that were sent to her, and he took it right to the school administration, it went right to the FBI, it turns out one of the four boys was the son of a governor, I think, of the state. And in any case, she said, the thing that was so stunning about it, it was they immediately, she became both a victim and a villain. She was considered a villain. You're stirring up racial hatred. She didn't even take it to anybody other than to the school teacher who then took it and it got boom, 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 and it turned into this massive thing. And then the next thing was, is they tried to turn her into a victim. Oh, you're being attacked, you know, and blah, blah, blah. She says, you know what? I, it took her like four or six or eight years before she said, you know what, I'm tired of being a victim. W when you're a victim, you can spend your whole life being a victim, but what does it do for you? It just makes you weak. It makes you, she says, now that I think about it, what those four boys did, they were out on a joy ride and they did something really stupid. Was it racist? She says, probably not. But the media gets hold of it and plays it into and it turns it into this big, massive conflict. But the end result was it propelled Candace Owens forward into the, to the, high, the limelight because Candace Owens then um, turned away from the, the traditional liberal mentality that is pushed upon the black community. And she says, no, I'm tired of this. And she began to think things through for herself and the abortion question and a whole bunch of things. She says, hey, wait a minute. Margaret Sanger that started the whole abortion thing was an outspoken racist. She wanted to destroy the black community. And so this young woman who's extremely articulate, and she's been before Congress many times, and she says, I'm tired of victimology, of, of being a victim, because that's exactly what the communists want to do, is they want to make us all victims. So, well, it's not fair because my great-great-great-grandfather was a, a slave, therefore you should pay me something. And, and it's, part of, it's all part of a communist plot. I noticed something that as he was talking about, as he was wrapping up the thing on the feminist movement and talking about Betty Friedan, you know, and she's trying to persuade us that she's a, uh, a housewife that's been victimized and therefore she's speaking out. No, she was a communist activist. It's all a lie. It's all a front. But as he was talking about that, he showed a picture of his family. Where was his family in that little video clip? Did you notice? They were sitting around the family table having a meal together. Um, I, I fear that many Christian homes are losing the battle at the family table because it doesn't exist anymore. Listen, we need to fight back for traditional values, and one of those traditional values is the family sits down around the table. We don't get up and walk around, somebody goes over here and sits and watches TV, and somebody goes to their room, somebody's got their computer going. We need to fight to come back to the family table. The family table is where we sit down as a family, no phones allowed, no texting allowed, and we face each other face to face and talk about what's important to us. How many of, of these... Uh, uh, mass c killers that are, how, how come all of a sudden we have all these young people carrying out these mass murders? Huh? Maybe attention, but I think part of it's because they've, there's no family table anymore. We've lost it. When a family sits down around the table and gets rid of all the junk and we just enjoy a meal together and we sit down around the table and we talk, we actually say thanks to the Lord over the, uh, the food and then we share could you please pass me the green beans, please? And we just learn to communicate as human beings around the family table. It resolves all kinds of things. And the communists want to destroy the family because they know that when the family is strong, the nuclear family, they can't resist that. Okay, so they're going to attack the family and they're going to attack, they're going to attack the church. They're going to infiltrate the church. And by the way, many, just one second, many things, many times what's done is we create so many activities at church that it helps tear the family apart. We want to have some activities, 
but we don't want to overdo it. We have also done this with sports. We've done this with drama. We've done this with dance. We've done this with all kinds of activities that take us away and break our family up over and over and over. Now, you may say, well, oh, but that's so important for our kids. You know what? The family is more important than any of it, more important than our athletics, more important than all these activities that we've done. We need to be a family. That's critical. Yes, Aaron, let me give you a mic. You said infiltrate the church on this topic of the feminist movement. Are we allowed to identify popular female Christian personalities as feminists within our own church movement? Well, this is an interesting question, and I think we need to, to, to really think about um, that question. Because I know there's a lot of discussion about, um, well, are we allowed to, to listen to Priscilla Shire or Beth Moore, for example? There's a, two often singled out top, uh, targets. If it, I personally am completely supportive of women who are addressing women's groups. Their main issue is to address women groups and to encourage them to grow in their faith. Now, if, if they're heretical, if they're clearly teaching women to turn away from Jesus Christ, that's no, that's no good. But many times what we do is we take, um, we take what Scripture says about how women should act in the local church. Scripture says that they're not to be in a place of authority. And then we take and extrapolate it and say, therefore, they can never teach in any situation. No, I frankly think it's a real good thing to have godly women teaching women in our church. No problem with that at all. In fact, I think it's important. So it, it's a great question because at the same time, when I was in seminary, uh, one of our professors to teach us the importance of egalitarianism and so forth brought in a pastor's wife from one of the churches up in the Portland area who goes to churches and preaches. Sunday morning sermons. Uh, that really stretches it for me. Uh, because the pulpit on a, on a Sunday morning in your, your primary service of a church is, the pulpit is an authoritarian position, isn't it? Uh, now, I personally have no problem with the woman being the president of a Christian Bible college. Doesn't bother me a bit. Not a bit. Because it's not inside the, the organism of the church, which is what the Scripture clearly talks about. Um, so, so we have to be careful that we, don't, that we don't go from one extreme to an opposite extreme and, and make a mistake in doing so. There is a place for women in ministry in our churches. And I think it, part of the problem that, that, that we have today is because we have said, oh, we can't have a woman teaching in any circumstance. Then we end up, the group, another group goes in the opposite direction. It gets worse than if we would have just said, no, what it's trying to tell us is the woman is not to be an authority over a man. And some people say, yeah, but some of these cases, there are men in the meetings. <laughs> yeah, I guess if they choose to go, that's not a problem. Uh, but it's different than, and even at a seminar, um, uh, Nancy Lee DeMoss you know, has been involved. She was, went to Campus Crusade uh, in, in, back in Denver, when was that, the 90s or sometime, and was, was, was there at a time when she got up and spoke, became the catalyst message for a tremendous revival to break out amongst the Campus Crusade leaders. Uh, you know, I probably would have been a little hesitant to have a woman be one of the keynote speakers, but again, it's not in the context of a local church. It's a little bit different situation. It's a seminar situation. So I think that we have, to, we have to be a little bit careful that we don't do as Jesus said and strain out a gnat and swallow a camel because we're capable of doing that. We, we're very capable of doing that. Did you, you're going to say something? Maybe yeah. Aaron will loan you that. And I think you pointed it out. We need to understand the difference between being in a point in a, of authority and being someone who is teaching about something and not in a point of authority. You know, at a seminar, she's just teaching something she knows about. It's not an authoritative, you know, you can take it or leave it, you know, situation. So I think that's where, you know, we're straining that gnat and swallowing the camel when we start doing that. Sure. It's, we've got to learn the difference between the two. Sure. And if we go to the book of Revelation in, in uh, I'm not sure which of the churches it is where you have that woman Jezebel, 
um, well, look at what she was doing. <laughs> she was totally immoral, yet she was ensconced in a position of authority where she had no business. And so the, the leader of the church is called out, how, how, how dare you let this happen? But again, that's a little bit different situation than, uh, than having a, a woman that's teaching to women's groups and uh, having a real impact, because I thank God for some of these, these lady speakers. Remember Myrna Alexander up in Portland? <laughs> she was, she was uh, the wife of one of the professors, and what a, what a, she was such a down-home kind of woman. I mean, when they announced her for her to get up and speak, they couldn't find her. They were looking around for her, and she comes jogging out. She'd just been in the restroom, and she just, she's just such a character, Whoa, you know, and, and everybody got a chuckle, but she was a, a, she, this woman was rock solid, as, a, as a, a teacher of God's word for the women, for the seminary wives, you know, you couldn't have asked for a better teacher than, than Myrna Alexander. So uh, do women have a place like that? Absolutely. Um, but let's be very careful that we don't allow the feminist thing into our churches. And um, we need to be prudent in how we do that. So it's a great, great, great point, Aaron. Thank you. And then uh, the homosexual movement. Um, so the communists set up, the, the society the communists set up to promote the homosexuality in the country was called the Mattachine Society. Uh, unbelievable what's been done. Let me ask you a question. Did you, what is the bourgeois family? What is the bourgeois family? Bourgeoisie or however you say it. Yeah. It's the, it, it's the Christian family. It's a traditional nuclear Christian family. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I never knew what the bourgeoisie family was. You know, you hear that thrown around, they thought, these are the bad guys, you know. You know, these are the bad guys. These are the guys that are, uh, you know, they're, they're like the, the wealthy people or something, or bad people. No, it's the tr- they, they want to attack the traditional Christian home. And so, wow, the sad part is, is they've been doing it very, very effectively. All right? Okay, any other observations? We're done really time-wise. Last thoughts? So next, next week we'll start with why are they so against morality? Again, if you want to have a copy of the transcript, send me an email, say, please send me a copy of the transcript. Yes, Julie. Yes. Yes. Do you have your microphone on? Then we can be heard. Thing worse than the problem because you think it's going to fix it. Right. And so it's just like in the church, you're t- you've got this problem and you, take, you go to the way over the other extreme. And right. You... <sighs> right, right, right. So what happened in Portland yesterday? Huh? What was that all about? What ha- how'd that happen? What happened? It started, it started with this uh, right-wing group who wanted to go and protest in Portland, right? Portland, Oregon. And as soon as they went through the proper channels to do what they're supposed to do to get permits and so forth, right away Antifa says, we're going to be there and fight you. And so when you, Antifa, they, 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 once again, the lie in the name, anti-fascist, no, they are fascists. They pretend that they're anti-fascist, but they're not. These are the groups that are causing chaos all over. They've already been active in Portland. In fact, there was that one reporter who was reporting on them that they beat him up on video. It's all filmed. I mean, he literally had brain damage from what they did to him. And, uh, but they're all wearing masks. Well, the, the, the right-wing group comes to town, and they're not wearing masks. They're wearing body armor because they know they're going to be confronted. But then Antifa comes to fight against them. And, and so you read the news articles about it. If you look in the news from yesterday and today, you'll see, oh, the right-wing group, you know, rallies in Portland, and they're going to make it look like the right-wing group is the one that stirred up the trouble. Sort of like in Modesto, when a group says, we're going to do a straight pride parade. Oh, no, 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 no. You can do a gay pride parade, but you cannot do a straight pride parade. So you can protest in favor of the bourgeoisie family, but you can't protest... (laughs) You know, you see where we're going? Patrick. Okay. Okay, it's everywhere. Well, and the, and the guys that do it, they fly them in, they bring them in from all over the place. But 
But when you read the news articles, they'll say that the right-wing group is bringing them in. They try and make it sound like the Antifa were local in Portland and these, and these other bad guys came in from out of town. Look at the news articles. The news media are playing right into the hand of the very division that's tearing our country apart. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. So uh, in the next service, we're going to talk about the eight-ton eight elephant that's in the living room of all of us that's really at the heart of all of what we're talking about. All right, be back in 10 minutes.